name's John Yao, and today I'm going to talk about the sculpture John Bay, and uh, the title of my lecture is The Other Side of Steel, and you'll see why as I start this lecture. So John Bay's Bay story is one of upheaval, immigration, adaption, and independence. He was born in Seoul in 1937, the youngest of three children. His father was an activist Korean Presbyterian minister who was committed to Korean liberation and was off and away. Bay did not meet his father until he was eight years old. Uh, Bay's mother, who spent her childhood in Russia, where she received her education, in which she and her family were forced to leave during the Russian Civil War, uh, raised him and his older siblings. During World War II and the Japanese occupation. The mother brought the children to Ilsan, a rural area northwest of Seoul. Because of his parents' political leanings, Bay and his family were isolated from other Korean families, and he spent much of his time alone as he was significantly younger than his siblings. He began to draw at an early age, and his mother taught him to play the piano. When he was eight, his mother arranged for him to study art with the man who had received the French academic training. I think it's important to recognize that there are two things that uh, John learned as a child. One, drawing or studying art, and the other is learning to play the piano, because I think music is important to his work. And this is a picture of him in a studio when he's a younger man. I always think it's good to know what an artist looks like. All right, 1949, shortly after North and South Korea became formally separate countries, Bay's mother wrote to friends about bringing his uh, family to uh, America. And then it was suggested that they go to Wheeling, West Virginia. During the trip across the United States, the family stopped in a number of cities. In Toledo, they stayed with the pastor who's also a friend, and he suggested Pei's two younger children should have American names. John's father decided their names should be John and Mary. When John was 15, his parents returned to Korea to fight for liberation, and he began living with an American family. While growing up in Wheeling, Bay played football for the school he was attending and took Sunday, Saturday art classes and had his first solo exhibition at the Olga Bay Institute in Wheeling. At the age of 21, he received a full scholarship to Pratt Institute in Brooklyn to study industrial design. Two years later, 1960, inspired by the work of Theodore Rozak, a sculptor, whose work he saw in the exhibition New Images of Man at the Museum of Modern Art, he called them and eventually began working as a studio assistant. So I'm gonna show you some early work by uh, John Bay and also by Theodore Rozak. So this is a photo of Theodore Rozak's studio, which was in the West Village and which is where John uh, worked with uh, Theodore. So you can see some sense of a sculpture. And this, this is a sculpture by Theodore Rozak from 1959. So now this is a sculpture by John Bay in 1963. And you can see there was a strong influence, but you can also see in this, I think will become clear in the next image. On the right-hand side, you'll see all these use of uh, long thin steel rods and then above it, the kind of drawing that he's done in space with these steel rods. Now the rest of the sculpture seems more like found material, but that is really important because in the same year, 1963, he starts using steel rods, which he welds together to make a form. And this is really the major characteristic of John's work is that he began using steel rods fairly early in his career, and he's used them throughout his career. And it's, it's, it becomes a way that he can draw in space. So you can imagine this is a three-dimensional drawing to some degree, right? 
and then this kind of repetition of certain linear forms that he makes. And yet the repetition always uh, in this work implies difference. They're never the same, right? There's echoes, but they're not the same. The other thing that he did, and this was done while he was a student at Pratt, and I decided to show it uh, still in his house in Connecticut, is to show you the kind of talent that he had. This is a, he was asked to do a trompe l'oeil painting, and uh, this is what he did. So these, this is a painting of three reproductions in a box that he made probably when he was in his early 20s. And it's quite remarkable. And he lets you know that it's a painting because he's left part of it in the figure you see in black in the front, unfinished, right? And then he signed his name at the bottom, John Bay, J Bay. Uh, it's quite remarkable. You see these three well-known uh, paintings and then you see what he's done with them, right? All right, so John Pay at Pratt, he received the BA in his industrial design in 62. He received an MFA in sculpture in 64. And then in 1965, three, within three years of him getting his degree, he becomes the youngest professor to start teaching at Pratt and he's appointed the head of the sculpture department. The reason he's appointed the head of the sculpture department is that Pratt, when he entered, did not have a sculpture program. He managed to get an MFA in sculpture by uh, various ways, and then they realized they needed to expand. So three years, he goes from being an undergraduate to being a professor who started and directs a sculpture program. During the same period, gets married to Yun Suk, has two children, buys a carriage house in the Clinton Hill area, and then with his wife began having parties for diaspora Korean artists, musicians, and writers living in New York. Among the artists he met, and I think this is also important, he met Nam Jun Paik, who moved to New York from Germany in 64, Kim Wong Ki, a pioneer of abstract painting and career, and Kim Chang Yul, who becomes known for his water drop paintings after he moves to Paris in 1969. So the reason I bring this up is, um, and this is the work of the three, just one work by each of them. This is Nam Jean Bake, who's considered the father of video art. And this is uh, Kim Wan Ki, the painting uh, this is one of the few paintings he did all in red. And you'll see that they're made of tiny little marks just covering the whole canvas, right? And then this is a water drop painting by Kim Chang Yul. So the fact that uh, John Bay meets these three artists, becomes friends with them, suggests that there's a, a completely different art world from the one that exists in New York that New York to some degree didn't recognize or didn't even know about. And yet they helped each other and supported each other. It's uh, Kim Wonky's widow, in fact, who first gets uh, John a gallery in Korea where he starts to show regularly. So I think that's important to realize that at this moment uh, in history, Korean art artists have achieved the major kind of modern, uh, modern achievement. And that even though they're not recognized, say in America, they're recognized elsewhere and they begin to help each other. And they're also recognized in Korea. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about steel rods because that's what John use, uses. John has said that steel rods are affordable and durable, but can disappear after becoming rusty. I like such a nature of wire because it is similar to that of a living thing. And then in an unpublished oral interview with Leila Viral, John made a further distinction about his use of steel. And this I think is very important. He's talking about David Smith. 
David Smith loved working with heavy pieces of metal. There was a branch of people who liked the basic strength of steel. They wanted steel to look like steel. Whereas I think I was beginning to see the other side of steel, which with a welding torch, you're taking something very strong and solid and you're melting it until it's liquid. Now, if you think of Richard Serra and various other sculptors working with steel, John's remark has a certain weight. Steel, they want steel to look like steel. John is thinking of steel as a kind of liquid. So that's really very different. And I think that's important to real recognize. So here's an early piece by him. Now, if you look at it carefully, you'll see that it's lots of little pieces of steel welded together. This is not a piece of metal that's been perforated. It's a literally made little section by little section, little wire by little wire, welded together till it makes this organic form, right? So it's very different than what's going on around them. Um, and at the same time, it stands on its own. It's, it does not look like anyone else's work. And I think that's also really important to recognize in John's work. And then he made this work in 68, which he described to me as a, he, want, he was thinking of drawing in three-dimensional space. So he makes a frame and then he puts a form in it that's the drawing. So it's really a kind of witty commentary on drawing in space, right? That he's literally making this metal frame in which he's suspended a form with these two wires or um, uh, steel rods actually. And again, it's a drawing and it's a sculpture, it's both. And he does it again, this time in a cube and the form becomes more complicated. And again, you, if you look carefully, it's like little cells growing together, right? To make this form. So there is a side of John that's always interested in the organic, um, which is very different. And the other thing is, well, the minimalists are working with um, fabrication or found materials. John is working, making things. And this distinguishes him from that group. And to some degree uh, explains why he was not recognized earlier in his career. And then he makes this amazing piece uh, in Volition 1974. And again, it's this form within a form within a form. Now, uh, some people have said, oh, this resembles Ruth Azawa. And they're wrong in thinking that because Ruta Zawa's piece is flexible. This is not flexible. It's welded together. It's both vulnerable and yet solid, right? Solid in the sense that it's, it stands on its own. So there's this kind of play between the vulnerable and the, and the solid, right? And then he pushes it further. I think that's the other thing about John is once he does something, he always seems to want to push it a little further and see what he can get. And again, it's this form with inside a form and you feel like he's you know, been inspired by science, by nature, uh, by various sources. And yet at the same time, it stands on its own. It's rather a unique piece as much as John's work is or this one, Sphere with Two Faces, 1976. And uh, it's remarkable. He says he doesn't know what he's gonna do when he sets out. And that basically he's responding to what he makes. So in a sense, he finds the sculpture through the making of it, right? Rather than having a plan and fulfilling it, he basically starts with you know, welding one of those uh, rods to another, and then just slowly makes the piece. 
And it's really a kind of making that's unlike anyone else. And, it's, and it speaks to a certain kind of patience and a certain kind of vision that he can arrive at this form. Or this persistence of forgotten things, 1977. Now I'm bringing this up and I'll bring up uh, other things later, but one of the things about his work, and you can see it in some of the ones I've already shown, is if sculpture is about permanence and solidity, his is really about change. You see this piece changing as it rises up in the air. It doesn't have an ideal form, but rather a form that he's found. And it's, again, I would say a very complicated three-dimensional drawing that instantly you begin to see the whole thing. But then you want to, you know, if you're in the room, you want to see how did he put this together, right? Because on one hand, it seems really straightforward, but on the other hand, how did he keep track of all of this and make one after another and get it to rise off the base up into the air, right? So, or this one, therefore I am, right? Comes out of Descartes, I think, therefore I am. But so you can see it as a kind of self-portrait or a portrait of an individual, not necessarily John Bay himself, but all of us that we're, complicated, uh, we can be seen, and at the same time, we're mysterious, right? And I think this is really a kind of mysterious piece, again, with the sense of how does he keep track of everything, right? Or this one, again, a column of silence. Now, it twists in space as it rises up. So if you think of other sculptures that are columns, most of them are about solidity rising toward the sky and a certain kind of ideal. His are always about change, that the world is always changing and that he's acknowledging that fact, right? That sculpture does not, sculpture does not exist outside of time. The time is always changing and passing and that everything is affected by it. So that's one of the uh, kind of philosophical differences between his work and say the work of Donald Judd or Carl Andre. His work is really always about change, right? It's not about presence in the sense of the minimalists. And that's why I wanted to bring up uh, Brancusi. Brancusi, his column is an ideal form repeated. It rises to the sky. It's not about change, it's about a kind of permanence, right? It's about the essence of something, right? The essence of a form. John is not about the essence of a form, but about change. It's two very different ways of thinking about how to live in the world and, the art, and his art reflects that. So think of uh, Brent Cousy's column and then think of what John does here, right? It rises and it changes and it moves through space. Uh, very different. And it, then it suspends these planes and you feel like, are they rising up these planes from the bottom one on which it, the piece rests or are those planes falling back down, right? So there's both a sense of rising and falling in this piece and, and also a sense of movement. So really, you know, if you think of Calder, he had the pieces, Alexander Calder, moving. John suggests movement without having the pieces move. And I think that also is something to think about. For this piece, again, something undergoing change. And we don't know if the change is for the better or for the worse. It's just unavoidable. Change is unavoidable, right? Or this amazing piece, which as you see in the front is hollow. It's almost like a vase tipped on its side. And yet, look at all the things he's done to put it together. So it's really a kind of uh, masterful uh, use of just a single 
steel rods over and over again. And that's uh, what I think is really remarkable about John's piece. He's using a very simple material uh, and assembling something as complicated as this, right? So this is what John said. Working is like a private ritual. It brings me back to the idea of reaching a communion with a sense of silence, finding my way within and without it. I have no preconceived idea when I start working. I work and react to what I've done. I become comfortable with silence. And that's John. And then think of what Paul Clay said. Drawing is taking a line for a walk. Making a drawing is first about communicating with yourself. Although these two people didn't never met each other, you kind of see in a way how they agree with each other, right? And you would say that John is an, a sculptor who's taken a line for many, many walks and achieved many, many different things. And then it really is when he says making a drawing is first about communicating with yourself, you can hear John echo that in some way, right? So I wanted to show other things that he did. If you look carefully, you see that it's really uh, the walls of this piece are basically uh, steel rods welded together to form a sheet. So again, it's, it's rather remarkable. And then it's a, he calls it a torso so that it's both an abstract piece and a, and a figurative piece. And you can't say that it's one or the other, but it's both. And I think that's important to think about, right? And it almost looks like it's carved, but it's not. It's really something he could have only achieved by using by the method that, that he uses to make his work. Or this piece, which I really like called moon phase, he made two. So here you see or sense the moon with that um, indentation and the way the wires are welded. And then, and then you think of the light reflected on it, the kind of silvery light that you get from uh, the ambient light. So he's also conscious of the light cast on the piece or the shadows that come off the piece. I think all that is part of it. It's not like the work exists in any kind of ideal isolation. The work exists in the environment. And I think that's also important to think about. So here's another one. And again, you see the texture that he achieves with all these little um, sections of steel rod. So that there's a kind of, the sculptures are both have a texture to them and a physical presence, right? And I think that's important. It's not just a piece of stainless steel. It's really about the texture of the thing, right? It's haptic, as they say. Or this organic form that he's made that it kind of reminds you of different things, but then it's not clear exactly. You can't quite name it. Right, and I love the fact that you can't quite name it. I mean, he calls it Gagum, and I, I don't know if that means something or not, I haven't asked him. But the fact is you can't name what this is. You feel like it is something, but what? You know, a form of undersea life? I don't know. And, but once you start looking at it, there's all sorts of things, the way it folds, undulates, and then the texture, it's always kind of bringing, it's visual, it's physical, and it has texture. Three qualities. For this one, which is quite stunning. And then he made family tree. Uh, yeah, people are interested in their family tree. And I think John's family tree is quite interesting just from what I've told you. And yet he doesn't make it explicit. He just makes these forms, right? That, but they're large. I mean, that's one of the reasons. And they have a relationship to nature. You, you can sense it. 
and he's placed them outside. And at the same time, they stand on their own, they're separate from nature, which is sort of like being a human being, right? We're part of nature, but we feel separate from nature. And we always have to figure out what our relationship is to nature. And then I wanted to show this large piece, which I believe is in Korea, probably in Seoul. Uh, again, if you think of uh, Brancusi rising straight up, the endless column, John's twists in space. It, it has these two, it has these various planes suspended. They look like they're falling. They're held in space by the, by the uh, metal rods. And it's, so again, it's like this kind of visually compelling piece that holds your attention. And you have to then think about it or reflect upon it. What's he getting at? Notes from the stars. Is this piece descending to us with its notes or are we rising up to read the sky? Or another one, notes from the stars too. These are very masterful pieces to make the steel bend and curve like that and to have it seem so, as he would might say, liquid. It, it seems more liquid than anything else, right? And yet it's solid. So, and it's, and it's just, it's a piece that you can walk around. It's gonna change as you walk around it. So that's another thing. One, you know, sculptures, how do you walk around it? And that's one of its things. It's something you walk around. Now, this is the piece that's going to change as you walk around. And then it can also be very whimsical. Uh, this piece, it's like a jumble of lines. And yet, as you look at it, you feel like there's some underlying sensibility that enabled him to make this piece be whimsical and light uh, and at the same time be in control of all of these things, right? And then you start to see them as silhouettes of things, but then they kind of elude description. Um, yeah, I really like this piece. I, it was, it's one of, it's a, an outlier uh, in a sense among John's pieces. But as an outlier, it, it kind of uh, adds another dimension to his work. And then this is from 2021. Uh, so you could, I wanted to show, so I started with something from 63. You could see all, every decade he's made important work. He's never not made important work. He's never, and he's, even though he's always worked uh, with the same material and the same method, you can see the vast differences among all the works. And I think that's really important. Now I wanted to show some drawings. So the other thing about John's work is it's really delicate. And I think we don't think of sculpture in steel as delicate. And yet there's a kind of delicateness to his work. And, and a kind of, if you go back, and I'll just go back, it's, it has a vulnerability. We don't think of sculpture as being vulnerable. We think of it as being impervious, right? Marble sculpture is impervious to time. And yet the way this bends and it kind of implies a vulnerability. You know, it's almost as if it's been affected by the weather, right? The wind. Or this. It doesn't seem impervious or invulnerable. It seems, if anything, whimsical and vulnerable. Even this, right? The four seasons. So look at the drawing and you see that it's also made of lines of different densities put together. Uh, so it's really the drawing is related to the sculpture. And this drawing, which, you know, 
it parallels the sculpture, but it completely stands on its own. And it's quite a remarkable piece. If you ask me, it's how does he know how much to put in and when to stop? Um, and how does he kind of keep it all even all the way around and yet different all the way around? I mean, there's so much going on in this drawing and thinking about it. Um, how he gets different densities. This is really kind of a masterful drawing. Um, or this one, which relates back to the family tree. Uh, but you see it as, you know, these different uh, things intersecting, overlapping, uh, in a kind of remarkable way. And that's my talk.